Well, it truly was an incredible season. Just an amazing year, a return to normalcy after last year, uh, this 2020 season with the COVID abnormalities all over the place. Conferences starting up late, conferences not playing full games, teams not playing full seasons. After all of that, it was wonderful to get back to a regular season, and this season did not disappoint. The most top 25 or top 15 updates of all time this season. Just chaos top to bottom, amazing matchups, true storylines. It was really a true, I mean, you talk Cinderella seasons, you talk national storylines. This was the season to make sure you were behind a TV set or at least uh, at least behind a TV set, if not out in the stadium watching your team play this season because it was an amazing year all the way up until bowl season. Now, bowl season had some exciting matchups. It had some exciting games for sure. But overall, bowl season was quite a step back or disappointment to the regular season where from teams opting out, I mean, Boise State didn't even play in a bowl game even though they were scheduled to appear in one. Uh, teams opting out, players opting out, whether uh, deciding not to play or transferring to other schools previous to prior to the bowl season. And then just very disappointing matchups all over. Overall. I mean, there were some teams that you were head scratchers as how they ended up facing each other. Now, of course, you know, some of those teams ended up turning up upsets that like UAB beat BYU, and that was a matchup that never should have happened. A top 15 team in BYU has to go and play UAB. Uh, so, and you have to ask yourself, would that upset have happened if BYU was playing a team worthy of their top 15 status? Uh, and I think 9 and 3 UAB at the time. So, there, the bowl season itself definitely was a step back from the regular season. And that is something that we have seen year in and year out. That ever-expanding number of bowl games creating a sense of meaninglessness to the postseason play, causing dips in TV viewership. There Now, some of the minor bowls did have increases in TV viewership uh, this season compared to last season. But, you know, of course, you're comparing it to an abnormal 2020 season. But overall, the trend has been downward viewership. Empty stadiums at bowl games, that is not uh, something that has changed at all. I mean, I went to a bowl game this season, and it was basically not even a quarter full. So decreasing TV viewership, decreasing physical attendance, exploding number of bowl games, 42 bowl games this season. I'm sorry, 41 bowl games this season, not counting the national championship game. Uh, and then an ever-increasing number of so-called opt-outs uh, or players transferring before the season. And now a new trend where teams are deciding not to play all together. Something has to be done to save this amazing sport of college football that we love so much because the bowl season is not meaningless. It can't be meaningless. The bowl season is the culmination of the entire regular season. There, The playoffs themselves are a worthy objective, but they should not be the only objective. In fact, the playoffs truly, you know, Cincinnati, rare exception, and a lot of chaos had to happen in front of them, and they basically had to go almost undefeated for three seasons straight to even get to that. But the playoffs as a whole, the way they stand, are not open to the majority of the group of five, and there are a lot of power five teams that lose one game are on the outside looking in in that system. So the playoffs truly are still exclusionary and they cannot be the end-all be-all of the postseason for all teams. And even if they were more open, even if expansion happened, the the rest, of the, what bowl games are, they're not just exhibition games. Bowl games are ways of, spring, of uh, springboarding your season into next year. They're a culmination of all the hard work that you've done. They're the reward for conference championship games. If bowl games are meaningless, then the, seas the conference championship games that set up teams' entry into these bowl games are also meaningless. And if conference championship games are meaningless, likewise is the regular season. I mean, people say, well, you know, why should players risk injury uh, to play in a meaningless bowl game? Why should they risk injury to play in a meaningless sport? If you say players should just opt out of the bowl games, well, why not opt out of the conference championship? I mean, say you're say you're in the Sun Belt, okay? And or sorry, even better yet, say you're in Conference USA, and your if you win Conference USA, your best bowl game that you can play in is against a second ranked, second overall out of that conference ranked team out of another Group of Five conference, UTSA, playing the second place team out of the Mountain West. That's the best bowl game you can get to, and if you have a top first round draft pick in that in a team playing in that conference championship game why not just opt out of the conference championship game let's take it further say you're in a power five team uh even and you are sitting at 
you're in te- say you're on Texas this is roster and you're a first round draft pick and you're coming up towards the last couple games of the season you're not it looks like you're not even get to get bowl eligible and if you do get bowl eligible what bowl game are you going to be playing and not a very good one why not just opt out the last few games of the season? You see how this this conversation continues all the way down? Hey, you have a great start. The first four or five years, you get uh, first four or five games of the season, you get plenty of tape out there for the draft. Why not just sit out the rest of the season? We cannot allow this to happen. And it starts by breaking down a, uh, multiple different levels here. A couple big ones for sure. The first one is we need to fix the bowl system itself. And the second one is we need to fix this issue with player opt-outs. And we need to address some of the reasons that these players are opting out and then some of the things that are allowing these players to opt out so easily. And this is what that video is gonna discuss. We're gonna go through 10 ways to fix the bowl season, not fix the bowl season uh, as in uh, like a like a gambling terminology <laughs> that's what i mean but to fix a broken system a broken bowl system that is falling apart if we lose the bowl season if the college football bowl season be- continues to be to be made to seem meaningless and eventually becomes meaningless then the rest of the season truly for the majority of college football teams besides an elite four is going to truly become meaningless even with playoff expansion so we're going to look at we're going to look at how this happened real quick right here at the beginning of this video, and then we're going to go through ten ways how this, this system needs to be fixed. Now, some of these ideas may seem common sense. A couple of them are going to be pretty radical as well. And I'm not looking to make friends in this video. I'm looking to fix a system that I ate, not a system necessarily, but a sport. I'm trying to fix a sport that I love. That I you know, kind of live for, you know, I'm not, I have lots of other things to live for. I have a great job. I have a wonderful family. Uh, I have a beautiful uh, 10 month old daughter now. So I have a lot of other things to live for. That's not what I'm saying. But as far as sports go, football, this is it. I mean, yeah, I'll watch basketball, especially my college teams. I'll watch basketball. But for a lot of us, football is the most important sport of the year. And and we have, my wife and I have an agreement that between September and January, that football season, that, that that's football time. The weekends, we're not scheduling on anything on the weekends. We are wa- I, we are sitting down and we are watching uh, Boise State and Liberty play and most of the other college football games as well. We're watching those games. I'm 100% available the rest of the year, but college football season is reserved for college football. And if we don't fix this system that is crumbling, that's going that this sport that we love is going to change completely and not in a good way. So let's look at how this happened first off. So how did this how did this state of affairs come about? Well, the first thing is was the overexpansion of bowl games. Uh, you look in 2000, uh, so the start of this new century. In 2000, there were 25 bowl games. That's it, 25 bowl games. So 50 teams out of, I don't remember, I didn't write down how many FBS teams there were total, some, something over 100, something like 120. So 50 out of 120 or so FBS teams competing in the postseason. An elite number, it was something to be shot that you really had to shoot for, that you had to be, prove yourself. I mean, Boise State, uh, prior to getting to their first bowl game, they, they won a majority of their games. I think they won like nine or 10 games and they still didn't get into a bowl game. So, you know, you had to, you had to be top tier in the FBS to get into the bowl games. They were elite, there was something that, that players looked forward to. You didn't see players opting out in 2000, that the postseason is what you were playing for. 2010, dramatic increase. 10 years later, 10 additional bowl games. 25 to 35 bowl games. 2014, an additional four. First year of the college football playoffs, you're up to 39 bowl games. And in 2021, we are now up to, as of this last season, 41 bowl games. So out of 129 FBS teams, as of right now, we'll have some new FBS teams joining the ranks here uh, in the next couple of years. But as of right now, 129 FBS teams, 82 of them are playing in the postseason. 64% of college football teams are playing in the bowl season. It's no longer an elite prize. It's a participation trophy. If you win six of your games, which by the way, don't have to be against your fellow FBS opponents. They can be against the FCS teams that aren't even in, they're technically division one, but they are not playing on the same level of college football as the rest of the teams that are competing for bowls. You can have five wins against FBS opponents and you get into a bowl game at six and six. Second issue, so that that has definitely, that has definitely caused the bowl games as they have expanded and become easier to access as we've 
past the tipping point of 50% of the teams being part participating in the postseason. We've had seasons, and this is really definitely uh, added to this idea of meaningless of the postseason. We have had seasons where there were not enough bowl eligible teams to play in the postseason, and they had to go after a five and seven team, and I think they break it down by academic rankings, had to go after five and seven teams to appear. And I'm not talking about this year where you had teams backing out, like with a uh, Wake Forest and I think it was NC State were scheduled to play, and then uh, NC State backs out. Um, or was it UCLA? Anyhow, the, the team, no, um, Texas A&M. Texas A&M backs out against Wake Forest, and then you ask them Rutgers. I'm not talking about that situation. I'm talking about teams, when you're lining up all the bowl games, you don't have enough bowl eligible teams when you're picking teams in the first place to play and you have to make exceptions just to fill the bowl roster that was just, that's just a few years ago that happened and that has definitely the the more the more easily accessible that something is the less value that thing has the next issue is the expansion of the playoffs now we are definitely not at where we need to be at the playoffs i did a whole nother video uh just suggesting a fix to college football uh, when the playoffs is concerned. It also fix the the parity, uh, sorry, the disparity between uh, FBS, uh, sorry, Group of Five and Power Five, and bring more parity to college football. So I have another video. I'll put that link in the description. But even with the playoffs not expanding to where we need them to be at to be fairly representative of all of college football, the expansion of the playoffs did make it more accessible to a larger number of teams. You didn't, no longer had to have a perfect record, even as a Power 5 team, basically, uh, to be that number one and number two team. Now you can get in with a loss. You know, the, the playoffs stay open. I mean, Ohio State loses to Virginia Tech at the beginning of the season in 2014 and still gets in. That is that would, unheard of in the BCS era. So the playoffs come along and teams now have, they, even if they lose a game uh, throughout the season, maybe even lose two games, they are still potentially, depending on their conference, potentially in the conversation to get in in the postseason. And it opens it up to other teams. Now the focus doesn't become necessarily the bowl game that your conference is linked to or the bowl game that, that you want to get into. It becomes the playoffs for a larger number of teams. The other issue here then is an irresponsibility among media members or the media as a whole. No longer are the bowl games brought up as something to be shot for, or the regular season discussed as a whole. It's the playoffs. Everything becomes the playoffs. Playoffs is the focus. Playoffs is the focus. You know, group of five, you know, screw them. They, they don't even count. They're not even involved. Or, you know, occasionally you'll have a dark horse candidate like you did with Cincinnati, finally getting, uh, being able to get into the playoffs to represent the group of five this season. Uh, but for a for a long time, it has. They have the group of five have not been in the discussion, and it's been more of a, a fairy tale storyline that's been thrown up. But the the discussion isn't who's going to be playing in the Fiesta Bowl, who's going to be playing in the Sugar Bowl, who's going to be playing in the Orange Bowl. It's who's going to be playing in the playoffs, and that is the only storyline that is getting any attention. And as the playoffs have sucked in all of the focus, even though they still do not represent a goal, an achievable goal for a majority of college football teams who are playing through their entire meaningful seasons, but with nothing that the media considers meaningful for them to play for. As you have these teams playing for and, con and competing, and, and the rest of college football still out there playing their regular season games. The playoffs sucks in all the attention, and the other bowl games simply become tertiary prizes that nobody really wants. And then the final issue here, and this is something that I definitely think impacted this season and was really the first impact of the first wave and is only going to get worse, is the advent of NIL. And I'm not going to do in this video, I'm not talking about whether or not that's good or bad or whether I'm for or against it, but it's the simple fact that the monetization of players making these players into financial assets definitely has impacted college football with the transfer portal. More transfers this season than any other season, just massive shifts, left around, successful teams. I mean, Oklahoma almost gets into the playoffs and they basically lose you know they lose their starting quarterback they lose a bunch of other key players and they're they're a top team in their conference that's unheard of to have your starting quarterback the leader of your do you lose both actually your first and second string quarterbacks both of who were started were starting candidates throughout the season you lose both of them one in south carolina and the other two oh shoot i'm bring like i think oregon um to oregon you lose both of your players gone just like that so the monetization of players has now made it that players are looking to transfer and jump ship early. And the earlier they can get over to these new markets that they are now marketing themselves in, the, the sooner they can get locked in, the sooner they can get part of that team and start establishing their brands. And it is incentivizing players to jump prior to the bowl season. I mean, there was a time when we talked about players leaving their senior year 
as something that was troubling. That was that was something that we used to talk about as, as a not a good trend. Now it's will they even stay for the bowl season? That will they even with eligibility left stay for the bowl season? That's the discussion now. I mean, Wyoming goes through, has a has a great season, wins their bowl game, and loses their entire roster. Same for Nevada. <laughs> um, so there is an issue that we need to fix, and these are these are factors that have contributed to this, and it's the fix to bowl season isn't necessarily just reversing each of these factors. There's definitely, there's been issues within the bowl system for a while that need to be worked on and, and fixed if this system is going to be corrected. And we're going to talk about that now. So I'm going to spend the last 10, 15 minutes of this video discussing the 10 fixes to the bowl season. And I'm, you know, I would like all, I would like to see all of these put in, in, uh, put in place to fix this system. But a few of them would definitely put us in the right direction. So listen, uh, you know, note, uh, give me comments, give me feedback, put them into the comment section of this video. I'd love to, you know, what you think is my most radical idea and won't work at all, what you think would be a beneficial, what I missed, what your own fixes are. This is a collaborative effort that we who love the game of college football are going to need to work together. The fix is not just expand the playoffs. It truly is not the only, that is not the end-all be-all because it's still the current format still lock out a large part of the group of five and truly a large part of the power five that are still going to need something meaningful to play for at the end of the season. And I think it all starts with these fixes. So let's talk about that right now. So first one here, and this one is a reversal. The first one here is to reduce the number of bulls. Easy, simple fix right off the bat. You should have no more than 50% of the FBS teams playing in bowl season. If you have more than 50% of the teams uh, play, uh, of FBS teams playing in bowl season, then the postseason is no longer something that should that is a prize to be earned. It is something that is automatically given if you end up average on the season. Why should averageness be rewarded? So fifth, the first step here is that 50% of the teams, only 50% of the teams should have a possibility of getting in because of open bowls available. Um, an easy fix would be go down to 35 bowls, which would put you at 70 teams. So that would put you at just exactly 50%. But I, I think truly a better number is that 25 bowl games that we had in 2000, where 50 teams, so 40%, so not even just 50%, 40%, that is an elite number of college football teams, and that is open to all conferences, all teams have a shot at getting into these bowl games. 40% of teams have a chance of getting into the postseason. The main point here is we need to reduce it under 50% or to at least 50%. I would like to see 40%. I think that this is going to increase, in addition to some of these other fixes, I think that this is going to increase profit margins. So right now, everyone just keep, wants to keep expanding bowl games because they think the more teams that they can throw at the television sets, the more viewership they're going to get. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that right now, a lot of, you know, besides the fan bases of these teams themselves, you're losing a lot of potential viewers because they're seeing you're losing the whole system. If you lose the whole system, you lose all the profit margins. I think that if you had more elite teams, more exciting storylines about uh, these matchups that are occurring in the postseason, you would attract larger viewership, and more importantly, you would attract more viewership, uh, lo more in-person viewership, more attendance, which honestly, that's going to be your initial higher price margins anyway, and especially more beneficial for the teams attending. So I think that if you we reduce the number of bowl games, make them more elite, make the storylines more exciting, you're going to first off put value back into the system as a whole right off the bat, which is going to allow you to continue per to perpetuate this system, which is the, which is the basis of their financial gain anyway. So the first thing issue here is reduce the number of bowl, which raises stakes, increases the viewership, and increases the storylines of the games themselves. The second issue, and I kind of touched on it already, is raise the eligibility for teams required to get into the postseason. So right now, six and six, one of those can be against FCS opponent. If you play two FCS teams, you got to get to seven. But six and six with a win against the FCS team gets you into the postseason. So first off, that is not even average. Because it's five FBS wins at that point. You know, some teams do have six FBS wins. But you can get in with five. You can be below average against FBS teams, the teams that are competing for this division of college football, the FBS, the football bowl subdivision. You can be below average against those teams and still get into the postseason. That is ridiculous. You should have to be above average. You should have to have seven wins against all FBS opponents. 
you should have to be above average against your peers to be able to get into the postseason. I am not in favor of FBS versus FCS teams. I don't think it does anything for the sport of college football as a whole. Yes, there are big paydays for these FCS schools. Yes, maybe these FCS schools rely on these paydays to support their programs, but that's not what your program should be relying on in outside factors like that anyway. And truly, within college football, whether you like it or not, there are two divisions of Division I college football, and they are not at all parallel. You have Division I, FBS, and truly, what you end up having, and you truly look at the facts, is a Division II, the FCS, and then all the other divisions shuffle down underneath them. So within Division I college football, we, just, we need to stop pretending like FBS and FCS are the same division of college football, because they're not. They're completely different. Now, you do have some teams like North Dakota or North Dakota State that can go out and beat FBS teams on a regular basis. Sure, that is true. But as a whole, FCS to FBS across the board, it is not an equal comparison at all. And teams that are playing at North Dakota and North Dakota State's level, if they want to be true Division I, should move up to FBS anyway. So, and what you're seeing, you're seeing FCS teams rising to the FBS. There's an explosion of them uh, coming in 2023. So, th regardless of whether it's fair or not, and I, I think that that argument is not necessarily the most important argument, whether it's fair or not, the truth is, if you're going to be appearing in the FBS postseason, the football bowl division postseason, you should be above average against your peers to even be eligible for that reduced number of bowl games that are even there in the postseason anyway. The, this will create um, this will create a uh, sorry this will create teams that are not just average teams but above average teams so you have better competition in these bowl games and another thing is you'll have less six and six completely unmotivated power five teams appearing in matchups that they don't want to be in anyway you'll see you'll see less players transferring out or opting out of those bowl games and less teams potentially backing out at the last minute. The bowl season should be something that is sh that that is a massive prize to be earned, and not simply a participation trophy saying, "Hey, you participated in twelve games and and managed to win half of them." Half shouldn't we should never reward C grades. We should never reward averageness. Above average is what should be the goal and the objective, and what gets you into the postseason. All right, step number three: make all bowl games. Open bids, so no tie-ins, no tie-ins from which you know you win your conference, you get into this bowl game. That is a completely unfair system that that ends up putting teams into matchups that they don't want to be in in the first place. Where maybe so, for instance, Power Five, New Year's Six games, you might have you have the number one team from your conference in the Power Five ends up getting into the playoffs. Now you've got the number two team in your conference who maybe they had a shot at getting into the playoffs, now appearing in this New Year's Six game that they didn't even want to be in in the first place. Unmotivated teams versus if you gave that to a highly ranked group of five team or even a highly ranked power five team that was motivated to be there, you would end up seeing you you would end up seeing teams that actually wanted to compete less opt outs less team opt outs potential for team opt outs less player opt outs and better matchups overall i mean right now you have a system where the number one the winner of the mountain west if they don't get into the new year six the winner of the mountain west which is was this year definitely was this year the best conference the group of five conference and for a long time in my opinion and many others opinions has been the best group of five conference so one of the top group of five conferences, if you win that conference, your reward is to play a about sixth ranked team out of the Pac-12. So you have usually a top 25 Mountain West team with somewhere between 10 and 12 wins, <laughs> um, 10, you know, probably 10 to 11 wins, playing a seven and five team out of the Pac-12. I mean, we all remember Boise State versus Arizona State uh, in 2011 where Boise State was top 10, played Arizona State, who I, I don't even know what their record was. I think they had like eight wins or something like that. Maybe it was probably worse than that because we destroyed it. I think they had like seven wins. And Boise State just demolishes them. It's not even a fun game. Whereas if Boise State had been able to have a chance at some of these other, you know, yeah, there's a, there's a shot for the group of five. They get one auto bid, assuming that their representative doesn't go to the New Year's to the playoffs, because then that auto bid disappears. Unlike if you win the SEC, the uh, even even get two teams from the SEC into the playoffs. The third ranked team from the SEC still gets the auto bid. See the disparity? See the unfairness? The main point here is. You shouldn't have a system where an 11-2 Utah State has to go, oh, sorry, an 11-2 uh, 
A 10 and 3 Utah State has to play a 7 and 5 Oregon State team out of the Pac-12. That Utah State team should be getting a worthy matchup. I'm not saying that they should necessarily be in the New Year's Six Bowl game. Actually, I'm not saying they should be in the, you know, a Fiesta Bowl or something like that. But I am saying that they should have a better matchup against a quality, against a top 25 or at least, you know, an 8 9 win Power 5 team versus matching up against a 7 and 5 Oregon State team that's not even worthy of their appearance. And Utah State beat them handily, too. So this is an issue within college football. Now, I know I, I would be willing to make an exception for the Rose Bowl because of the history and the legacy and the heritage behind the granddaddy of them all, the first ever bowl game, the first ever partnership or agreement between two conferences, you know, Big Ten, uh, Big Ten versus Pac-12. I, I would be fine with allowing that to continue as a locked-in tie-in, with you know, have a Big Ten versus Pac-12 team in that bowl game. I would be fine with that one. But every other bowl game should become open bids, and it should come up to some form of committee, um, not necessarily the CFP, but maybe the CFP, some form of committee that matches up the best teams and gives preferred matchups for conference winners and top 25s. It keeps conference winners, or the goal of winning your conference as an important objective to ensure you get into the best bowl game, and conference winners should be guaranteed some form of bowl game in this reduced bowl game format. And then top 25. If you're in the top 25, you get into a bowl game and you get into a preferred matchup. And then after that, whatever bowl games are left, once that's been filtered out, you, once you uh, once that's been filtered out, you're able to divide them up evenly after that. And then the, the, the 25 bowl games or 30 or however many bowl games that I'm listing doesn't necessarily include the playoffs in this format that I'm suggesting. Uh, but you have a system. You have a system where if you're a college where you're a winner of the of your conference and or top 25 you know you're going to go off and face a quality opponent you don't have a, a system or a situation where a top 15 team in BYU ends up facing a 9 and 3 team from UAB they're more motivated to play in that and they play differently in that bowl game the argument of whether they were motivated or not completely disappears because you match teams up based on how what how motivated they're going to be to play there you don't have teams you don't have a what was it a few years back was eight and four wisconsin ended up in the new year six <laughs> because the they needed the second ranked team out of the big ten to to play in a new year six game that is not a situation that should ever occur and that this system would be completely wiped out uh, step number four here, more open stadium games. Now, what I mean by that is there are some bowl games that the bowl game itself is linked to the stadium, the Cotton Bowl. It is linked to the Cotton Bowl in Texas. Uh, the Rose Bowl is linked to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. So there are some bowl games that cannot be separated from their physical location. I understand that. But there are a lot of other bowl games that the stadium that they play in is unimportant. And there should be a larger number of bowl games that can be shifted around depending on the matchup of the teams within them. So when you match these teams up, so say you have uh, Liberty versus Eastern Michigan. Instead of having these two teams play in Mobile, Alabama, it, you know, oh, multiple a couple day drive, you know, multiple day journey from either of these teams. I mean, basically it was the same distance from both these programs. It was like, I, I, I live in Florida, so I didn't have to do the drive, but I believe it was like a 10, 12 hour drive. I mean, it was a long, it was a long drive for both of these programs versus having that situation. You have the game take place in, I don't know, say Kentucky or Tennessee, where it's a six hour drive for both of these programs. You see what I'm saying here? More of a neutral site closer to the stadium uh, game so that you have matchups where you're actually getting the fans from these programs to attend the bowl games. The idea is that these bowl games are destination bowl games, but Mobile, Alabama is not a destination slot. And there are a lot of bowl games that are not truly destination bowl games. They really aren't. And, te and even then, I mean, the time of year that they're taking place, people have their own Christmas plans. They don't necessarily want to take, which are planned far in advance for a lot of people. They don't necessarily are able to change on the fly all their Christmas plans to attend some game in the Bahamas. You know, there, there truly isn't a situation here where teams are, are, you're getting maximum attendance with these bowl games, which I saw a map that besides the Potato Bowl, that there every other bowl game is basically on the south coast of the U.S. I mean, there, there really aren't any options for true neutral site bowl games um, because they're all 
down in the which makes sense with the warmer weather but you could schedule games dependent uh in their parts of the country that aren't frozen over in december and you could schedule these games uh in areas where fans can attend and still be comfortable and you could schedule them around times of year there's lots of fixes for this but we need more open site bowl games that can be shifted around stadiums that have that are available you know you have stadiums that are that that say, put themselves say we're available if you need us and then it's a big boost for that stadium if the teams get to come to that stadium because it's a big financial gain. You need to put their their name in a hat, <laughs> you know, not a little hat, obviously, but they can put their name out there as a potential location. And then depending on a matchup, you look at the stadiums that are available, and that also factors into your decision. And so you have better regional matchups. You create situations where you are encouraging fans to attend these games and increasing the importance of the games. I mean, if you're playing in an empty stadium, that is going to add to the idea that this bowl game is meaningless. If your fans couldn't even fought, bother to attend, then why are you out there playing? So more bowl games where fans are wanting to attend and able to attend would help with uh, more open site games here. All right, the fifth one here, and this might be a little radical, but I think that it's also a system that would help decrease the player opt-out. So we're kind of moving towards addressing the player situation itself. I think players need to be part of the selection process. Now, I'm not saying that every bowl game is determined by players taking a vote around the locker room. I'm not necessarily saying they have that much power, but they should be part of the selection process in some format, and there are lots of different ways you could go with this. Um, you could have players present a wish list that is taken into account when trying to match up teams, when you're trying to decide which teams are going to be the most motivated to play each other, which is going to create the best matchup. Well, if you already know that these teams want to play each other, that could factor into your decision. Um, maybe you could have a player's council where they are advising the bowl selection committee. Uh, you know, you've selected, voted players from, from each bowl eligible team, so seven win FBS team, has a chance to come in here and, dis and be part of the discussion. And that would probably be a little bit of a higher level, maybe a little bit more of a radical solution, but it would, that you see, you see, there's different levels that you go with this. You could have a, you know, you could have teams at least give them options. You know, you give these teams as you're filtering down the list, you give them two or three options and you let them vote and say, which of these matchups would you want? And then that factors in the decision. There's ways that you can do this, and I think that somehow players need to be brought into this selection process so that they are feeling more empowered, so that in this air age where they're already being financially powered, we all know that power comes from the checkbook, and these players are now being financially empowered, and they're going to want to have their voices heard. And if their voices are being heard in some form, whether it's small or large, there's going to be less chances or less possibilities of opt-outs or teams not being motivated to play. All right, here we go. Uh, number six, so we're almost done here. Number six, um, no transfers till after the bowl season. So purely discussing transfers here, not talk, talking about opt-outs, but purely discussing transfers, no transfers to after the bowl season. So right now, regular signing day is February 2nd, but early signing day is uh, it's December 15th or 17th. I'm sorry, I forgot to write that one down, but it's, just, it's, it's before the bowl season for a lot of these teams. And you have te you had the situation this year where you had thousands <laughs> or at least hundreds of players opting or transferring out before the bowl season even happened. So the trend in this in this solution at college football in you know, division one fbs i'm not talk, talking juco we're not talking high school signees but division one fbs players would not be eligible to transfer whether they're bowl eligible or not would not be eligible to transfer until after the bowl season so you'd have a, a period a transfer period after the bowl season where players can transfer you not necessarily even have to have a period. That's one dis, uh, example of how this could work. But at least have a time. You you set the last date of the last bowl game, and that is the date that players can transfer, and not before that. It doesn't matter if you play early in the bowl season or late in the bowl season because you don't want that impacting players' uh, decisions on which bowl games they want to play. But the last bowl game, the day the last bowl game is played, after that day you can transfer. First off, this sis this situation, this system of the early signing period wasn't truly created for college transfers anyway. It was created for high school signees who completed their um, high school early and wanted to do early enrollment so they could be part of spring training. That's what this was truly built for. It wasn't designed primarily for transfers anyway. Um, they 
could still, I mean, if you had the last bowl game, you could potentially move the bowl season up a little bit. It wouldn't have any, I mean, they're already discussing about doing that anyway with the expansion of the playoffs, moving the regular season back a little bit. Um, so you could move, start, have the bowl season start in December and have all the bowl games, especially with this reduced number of bowl games, wrapped up by January, which would still give most players plenty of time to enroll, get their classes, get their books, and get, you know, most schools aren't starting January 1st. If you start January 14th or some point halfway through January, so you'd still have plenty of time to get what you needed to. And besides, schools go out of their way for their players anyway. I mean, they have all this additional tutoring, uh, they have all these additional educational resources. They would be able to figure out a way to get these players caught up without having them lose too much here starting off a little bit later versus starting off halfway through December. And I think this this definitely, if nothing else gets enacted, um, this one definitely needs to be enacted because the transfer system, the transfer portal, is destroying the bowl season more of really truly than anything else has of as of yet. I mean, you had a you had a situation where between opt outs and transfers, LSU played with like thirty nine scholarship players. I wrote it down later here thirty nine scholarship players, or or Nevada where half their roster basically transferred to Colorado State. They followed their head coach, Norvell, to Colorado State, and they half their starting roster, and more, at least I think it was more than half their starting roster, wasn't even eligible for the bowl game. And that's players making important decisions about their collegiate future, which is, which is a valid decision, and wanting to get in early and not wanting to be behind the times based on how, what every other transfer is doing. But if you level the playing field and say all transfers are going after the bowl season, then that doesn't become an issue anymore. All right. Now here, this is this is going to be a little bit more fire and brimstone <laughs> right here. Stop accepting opt-outs as okay. We need to, the first thing here is we need to change the system that opting out of the bowl season is at all acceptable. It is not. These players are betraying their teammates. They are choosing themselves over their teammates, and it is destroying their teams and the college football season as a whole. Now, people want to talk about, oh, what about Matt Corral, his injury? Uh, that's a perfect example why players should choose themselves and get out uh, and go make their money while they can. Well, first off, Matt Corral, by all estimates, is going to be fine. The It shouldn't impact his draft stock too dramatically. I mean, injury is part of the game. It's a work hazard. You signed up for that. If you didn't want to get injured, if you were worried about injury, you shouldn't play college football in the first place. And that truly, I, I, I tore my ACL playing football. I understand the dangers from playing football. But if you didn't want it, then you should have picked another sport. Maybe something safer like baseball. <laughs> that, that is part of the, the injury risk. And, if, and we've already discussed, if you're going to opt out of the bowl season... Why not opt out of the conference championship if you're not really playing for a significant bowl game, in your opinion? Why not opt out halfway through the regular season or, you know, the last couple games of the season at last, at least? Why not just opt out after three or four games when you've already established enough tape and enough hype? Just get out, spend the rest of the season preparing, come in well ahead of your peers with rested and fully prepared. You've been working with a professional trainer this time. Why not? Why not just do that? So th there's a, it's a very slippery slope, and it's not, it's, it's not a slippery slope fallacy. It is a slippery slope of logical steps that if we don't nip this in the bud now and say that this is not okay, you, we are going to continue to devalue the bowl system as a whole, and, it, and eventually we're going to devalue our entire sport of college football and make it something that is not just a pipeline to the NFL, but something that's basically meaningless in itself anyway. The sport of college football requires meaningness to be exist. College football doesn't exist without viewership, without fans. It truly doesn't exist without that. And fans aren't going to want to watch something that in the end is truly meaningless anyway. So we need to change the language because it is not okay for these players because they didn't get there by themselves. No player is an island. The only reason you're even in this position right now it doesn't matter how much talent you have. It doesn't matter how good you are at the game. The reason you're in this position right now is because a university gave you a chance to compete. Fans committed their financial reserves to give, to give you a field, literally, to give you a stage for you to, to play on and to present yourself. And your teammates, they lifted you up 
and allowed the game to even take place. And in most cases, the more successful your team is, the more attention you're going to get. And most, you, yeah, draft, you know, um, NFL scouts will go anywhere. But the more hype you can get, the more name recognition you get is definitely going to help you on draft day. And the higher draft picks that we see are usually out of Power 5 teams. And it's not just because the great recruits come there, but there's a reason great recruits come there. Great recruits go to great schools because of great teams. You do not become a draft-eligible first-round pick by yourself. And the fact that these players forget about the discussion about opting out of their senior year. We're not even talking about that right now. But the fact that these players think that they can go through the whole season and get to the end and say, all right, I've got all the tape I need. I've done everything I need for myself. Screw you guys. I'm done. <laughs> when the post, the season's not over. The postseason is the culmination of the season. It's what the season means. And bowl games themselves are what you play for. If you're not playing for bowl games, what are you playing for? Yeah, playoffs are a objective, but they're not the, they shouldn't be the only objective. So we need to change. As, so the first bit here is changing the language. These players should no longer be referred to as opting out. They should be referred to as refusing to play because that's what they're doing. It's not like you have the generic, the, the, the general right to just opt out. Nobody does. Nobody has a right to just opt out of their responsibilities. You are, ref you are reneging on those responsibilities. You are refusing to perform the job that you have been, that you've agreed to do. Th that's what college football is, especially with NIL. It's a job. And you are refusing to show up to work. <laughs> you are not opting out. You are refusing to play. These players and their actions should be recognized for what they are. Selfish, traitorous, and quitting on their teams, their fellow teammates, their fan bases, and the universities that gave them a chance in the first place. And we need to change the language. I'm not saying every person, player who refuses to play should be labeled and referred to on the national stage as a quitter, even though that's what they are. But we at least, at least need to change the phrasing from opting out to acknowledging what it is, and that is refusing to play. Secondly, and this should be part of, if it's not already, I haven't looked at um, a lot of contracts or you know scholarship offer contracts, that kind of thing. But your, what, when players sign up to play for these teams, there should be language in there that if they choose, if they refuse to play the full seasons, that they are, not, I'm not saying they had to play all four years, but if they refuse to finish the season, there should be language in there that they, they incur financial responsibilities for the season they don't play. Or even the, for the seasons that they don't play. I mean, for instance, and I think that this is a definite cha situation that need, or change that needs to happen, is if you opt out, if you refuse to play in the bowl game, you should be responsible. And I honestly, I think this should happen even if you opt out of your senior year. But that might be a little bit too radical for the way college football is moving. But at least opting out of the bowl, bowl game, you should be financially responsible for paying back all of the tuition that you have received thus far. Because that tuition was given to you with the mindset that you would be representing this school all the way through. It's given with the idea that you're going to be representing them all the way through your eligibility. But at least, definitely, the seasons that you start. Now, if you're not able to play because of injury or something, you know, other set of circumstances, family member dies and you don't, you're not able to play, that, that is always going to happen in any job. That's fine. But if you're perfectly healthy and there's nothing wrong with you and you're just wanting to go get your bags of cash and you don't want to stay or stick around for your teammates, that should incur financial responsibilities. And while it might not necessarily deter all players, especially if you're going to go make millions at the next level, what does a couple hundred thousand dollars of tuition money really matter? It would definitely be a mental check and it would definitely help change the mindset that this is just something easy and free and incurs no responsibilities. You are now getting hit in the wallet. That's We talked about that's where the power is. That's where the mind center is, getting hit in the wallet. I addition, That's a minimum. I think in addition to that, there should be other financial play penalties for players that want to opt out uh, that could start by incurring the financial penalties of the, what, the uh, resources that they used at the school. 
If you don't want to play your commitment, fine, but you have to pay back for the resources that you use. I always hated the verbiage that players aren't paid to play college football and that they needed NIL. Now, whether NIL is fair or not, that's not what I'm getting into, but the idea that these players, that schools were somehow taking advantage of these poor players, these poor destitute players that, that weren't getting a penny for their services was completely bogus. Because first off, on scholarship, they're getting paid especially for elite universities that, you know, expensive universities, hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> to play. That's just off the baseline. But when you factor in tu uh, tuition, um, sorry, tutors, professional tutors, professional nutritionists, professional uh, athletic trainers, professional gym uh, equipment and trainers available, and then on top of that, and maybe the most expensive of all, the free marketing and exposure that these players get to build their brand that they will use once they're out of college football and now can use NIL um, and puts them in a spot in the first place to even be considered for the draft. You're talking about multi-million dollar deals that e every player on scholarship, and especially those that are using that next level, that are next level talent, multi-million dollar deals that these players are just part of. <laughs> These schools are putting in millions of dollars into the development of these players. And I'm not saying necessarily that you should have to pay back millions of dollars if you want to opt, if you want to refuse to play. But there should be financial consequences and there could be some financial burdens that you have to take on uh, if you refuse to play out your commitment. And there is, a, there is some precedent there. And if you want to say, well, that's not fair. Well, you know what? First off, I believe it is fair. First off, and secondly, there is strong precedent for this. I went to college on an ROTC scholarship. And after fulfilling my first year and signing my contract... If at any point I wanted to say, yeah, this whole, you know, even going through all the way up to my final year, yeah, this whole, you know, military thing, not for me. I'm going to go do something else. I would have had to have paid back my entire scholarship and, and I would have then had to have served um, X amount of years. And I don't remember the exact number because it was never something that was seriously on my, or not seriously, never something that was even crossed my mind to do. But I would have had to pay back my entire scholarship and spend X amount of years in the, uh, as an enlisted member uh, in the military as well. So um, I, would, I would have incurred military service regardless of whether I wanted to complete my officer commission. And I would have had to have paid back my ROTC scholarship. And honestly, these players, what they they are getting these scholarships for, it's it's really no different. Now, you know, there's not a military context, but these these schools are putting in the same kind of money that the military is putting into developing their members. And that whole mindset of you agreed to play something, you committed to something, you should see it out, applies to both equally. And so, you want to argue precedent or not? There is precedent for this circumstance. So this is incredibly important. I think it is something that definitely needs to be inputted in addition to these other steps that I've, I've uh, provided as well. All right, we'll breeze through the last few of these because this is a longer video than I intended it to be. Uh, but real quick here, so step number eight, uh, teams must be set prior to bowl selection. So if players are going to choose to refuse to play, um, they have to have made that decision at a prior to bowl selection because these teams that are being selected for bowl games, a lot of times they're selected based on the players on their roster. The matchups is what play what what people want to see. They're, the the you know if you're without your starting quarterback and your starting running back, you know, and then a couple of starting defenders and everything else, that that you're not the same team that came through the regular season. You're not the same team that the committee said, hey, this would be a great matchup with A team and B team. So. Teams must be set prior to bowl selection or risk lose forfeiting their bowl selection, uh, risk, risk forfeiting the postseason, and potentially incurring financial penalties as well. Uh, so it could be either or. It could be, you know, maybe you get to keep your bowl selection, but you incur financial penalties. What this would do, first off, it would be fair because that's what these, what the powers that be, the media companies, whatever, the, the bowl selection, and it's driven by money, but that is not fair to say we have this product as a team that we're presenting you for selection. And then when they come to actually take it, 
it's not the product that was presented at all. So it's very fair in that basis. But also another thing that this would do is it would force these players that are refusing to play to consider to consider the uh, the weight of their actions. I mean, the, what, especially if, if they're obviously if they refuse to play prior to. Uh, then it wouldn't impact it. But uh, if they refuse to play prior to selection, maybe that team doesn't get selected for a certain bowl game. And then, of course, if they refuse to play afterwards, it would incur financial pen penalties and forfeiture of that bowl game. It would force these players to realize what they're doing is already having this impact. This would just drive that impact home. That they are not just hurting, that their decision is not created in a vacuum. That their decision is hurting everybody around them, from their fellow players, to their coaches, to their fans, to the university as a whole, that their decisions are impacting other people. And now a lot of these people, these players that are deciding to not play for these teams in the playoffs, uh, sorry, in the playoffs, in the uh, postseason, their character uh, is questionable anyway. And so maybe that wouldn't be a determiner for them. But there are enough players out there that are deciding to not play because it's become an acceptable situation and truly care about their teammates even if they're not wanting to play. I mean, you have Pickett from Pittsburgh opts out and then still shows up for the bowl game. I mean, so he must care about his team a little bit, even though he made the unbelievably selfish decision not to play in a New Year's Six bowl game after putting his team. I mean, they were never in a position for the playoffs anyway. I mean, it's just mind-boggling that he would decide not to play. That's why the system needs to be fixed. But you have players that care about their team at least a little bit, and this... In fact, this uh, fix here would potentially convince them to not stab their team in the back. All right, uh, step number nine here is standardized back out procedures for teams. And this is an NCAA, uh, NCAA issue that they need to resolve. Because right now you have teams, and this, should, this is not just bowl season, this is regular season as well. Right now you have teams d saying, you know, all right, we have COVID issues in the program. We don't want to play. And there's really no questions asked. And COVID is going to be around. I try not to talk about COVID in my videos because it's annoying and we don't want to have to think about it. But the truth is that COVID, whether we like it or not, with these variants, it's the flu now. It's Or it's not the flu, but it is another illness we have to think about. And it's going to be around probably forever <laughs> with different varying implications. And so we need a firm system in place that says, all right, Fine, you don't want to play because your players got COVID. This is the baseline of players that must be eligible to play. Or you, if you have this amount of players to play, you're going to play without incurring some financial um, penalty for backing out of a bowl game. You know, we have Boise State backs out of a bowl game. We don't know the numbers. They haven't released them. There's no openness. We don't know. We know why they backed out because of COVID issues in the program, but we don't know what that meant. You know, did they have five players? sick? Probably not. Um, you know, was it 50% of their roster unable to play? Was 80% able to play, but they had no quarterbacks? But you have situations where LSU plays with 39 scholarship players and no quarterbacks, and they still play. Nevada, basically their entire starting roster gone. They still play. Both those teams lost, but they still played. The baseline is not where it's per for these teams that are making these decisions. The baseline is not here. It's down here. I mean, you can play with, if you have Human beings on the field, you can play. Uh, and these teams have massive rosters outside of their scholarship players. Uh, they have players throughout their rosters that are backups, that are walk-ons. They have scout teams. There is players that you can pull from to play. And I'm not saying that the level should be 50%, but there should be some form of universal level that the NCAA says, if you have this amount of players to play, you will play. If you have below that number... You can choose to play if you want to. You know, so let's say the number is 70%, because I think that would be fair. If 30% of your roster, or say it's for, you know, 50% of a certain key position group, are unfit to play due to COVID or, you know, unforeseen events, then you may opt out without penalty. Uh, if you have below that, if you're like LSU and have no quarterbacks and 39 players, but you still want to play good on you, you can play. What that would do is it would force openness, it would it would force um, transparency within college football, within these programs to truly see what's going on. There'd be no questions or doubts within the fan bases. And I think in the end, you would have a lot less teams backing out. You wouldn't have Texas, you know, I, again, I don't know the specifics, so I can't say, but the situation where multiple teams back out of bowl games, Boise State, um, 
UCLA, uh, Texas A&M, back out of bowl games with opponents who really want to play, and now they can't play in bowl games. We need a system because this is not going to change. If you forget everything else in this video, remember this one. There needs to be standardized procedures for why a team is allowed to back out of bowl game if it wants to. All right. Last, the last point here, the last one, and I think I've hammered this home throughout the entire video, but I'm going to say it one more time. And this is not a player specific. It's not a coaching specific. It's not a media specific. It is all of us. You, me, <laughs> sorry, me, you, watching this video, everybody, stop saying that bold games are meaningless. Because first off, they're not. That is completely false. These teams, you have most teams that end up playing in bowl games want to be there and have worked their tails off to get to that situation. And the entire regular season, logically, bowl games can't be meaningless because then the regular season has no meaning. And the regular season is very meaningful. People are, fans are coming out and supporting their teams. Players are playing their hearts out. The regular season is not meaningless. But if no changes are made and if people continue to use the terminology that is meaningless, it's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Even if these changes are made, if people continue to say that the bowl games are meaningless, they're going to become meaningless. Because we're already seeing this. Fans are going to go, oh, the bowl game's meaningless, why attend? Players are going to go, oh, the bowl game's meaningless, why stick around to play in it? And the less buy-in you have to the postseason, the less meaning you have in that postseason. So even something that was meaningful to begin with, loses its meaning and you create the very system and situation that you said existed when it didn't in the first place so of all things this one a lot of these issues can't be fixed by you know you or me i did it right that time <laughs> not all of the you know, most of these issues have to be fixed at higher levels than what i'm capable of doing but this is something that we are all accountable to and we can all work on is acknowledging the meaningfulness of these bowl games, the, the true prizes that they are for these teams that get to the postseason, and stop using terminology that discredits the system that college football is built on in the first place. We're not the FCS. We're not the football, cha the football championship subdivision. We're the FBS, football bowl subdivision. We're built around bowl games. And whether we, if we want to change it in the future, then change it. But for now, we're built around bowl games, and that's not changing anytime soon. And so we need to stop creating a false idea that if we're not careful, will become reality. So thank you for watching this video. I've had a blast this season. 117 videos is what I did this year, not counting this one. Um, so I had an absolute blast, or not this year because we're in 2022 now, but this season I had an absolute blast doing it. I previewed every single bowl game. I it took me a long time, so I know what I'm talking about when I say there's a lot of bowl games. Uh, but I had a blast doing it as well. I truly hope that the, the steps that I have put forth, that they are listened to, and some of them at least are implemented, because I think that this truly is the only way that we are going to save the sport of college football that we love so much. Thanks for watching this video. Make sure you like and subscribe. And as always, go!